to see you all. It feels like an eternity, actually, um, since we saw each other. Um, we'd like to acknowledge and thank Bev Birkin for uh, this class, helping sponsor this class in honor of the site of both her mother and mother-in-law and her anniversary. And we wish you, Bev, together with David Mazal Tov and many more years of good health and joy and joy. Thank you. One of the um, best things about not working full time is that we get to do what we want for the most part, for the most part. So I had to be in the Tel Aviv area earlier in the week and the previous day, listening to the radio in the car, they were interviewing the mayor of B'nai Brak, a city that I haven't been to since the 70s. Mm -hmm. When I was doing my BA and went there with my mother because we wanted to visit a great uncle. His name was Schluzer. Everybody say that, Schluzer. Anyway, so I heard him describing some of the educational treats of B'nai Brak. And one of the things that he said is that they purposely named adjacent streets in certain neighborhoods um, with a goal. What's the goal? That children would look at the streets with the encouragement of their parents and ask, well, why is this street next to this street? And it would allow the parents to tell a story. So for instance, so what yours truly did, since I was going to be in the Tel Aviv area, I went to see in fact that this was true. Mm -hmm. And it was. So just to give one example, um, there were three streets. One is called Yochanan Ben Zakai, a hero we've mentioned before, and Yerushalayim and Yavne. You'll remember that when the Romans were trying once again to have us gone and our Torah gone and the temple was destroyed, Yochanan Ben Zakkai felt that it was more important, I could test you, but I won't, to make sure that Torah learning kept on so he escaped from Yerushalayim to go to Yavne, which still exists, just as Yerushalayim does, um, to ensure that Torah study would carry on. Um, I love that. I love that. Um, okay, so we have talked of the need to think really think what our Torah and Halakha ask of us. And we have focused on serious thinking, perhaps more than feelings and emotions, lest anyone think that emotions are less important, we begin this series. We have also talked on more than one occasion about giving our lives meaning by placing ourselves within a chain, connecting with the past and thinking again and planning for future generations. Dorot Habaim. Now I'm going to ask you a blunt question. Does sensing we know what God wants of us because we've thought about it? <clears throat> does sensing, again, what God wants of us, does that give you and me a feeling of calmness as we go through what is a very insecure life? I'm going to repeat the question. And I'd like you 
to feel free to answer. As I always say, there are no right or wrong answers. Does sensing that we know what God wants because we've thought about it and we continue to think about it in each situation, does that give you and me a feeling of calmness? And I'm saying you and me because there are some of us Jews who, yes, are calm. Perhaps those in B'nai Bra. Does it give us a sense of calmness as we go through what is a very insecure life? Please, Esther. I'm thinking back at the time that my father died. So mm -hmm. my sister and my brother are very Haredi. And they started saying Tilim, and I actually was jealous at the comfort that they had that my father was in a better place. I believe in God, but my faith is not as strong as theirs. And to me, that was a wonderful example of what Emuna can do. Yeah. Yeah, we are sometimes envious of people who really, really believe that. Anyone else? Well, Bracha, yeah. you, you, Linda, you phrased it um, in a very particular way. <laughs> yeah. I, I, what was the end of it? You said, uh, "What God does it make us feel better to know that does God it make us feel?" I used on purpose the word "calm." Calm. Does it calm us down, even though we go through what we all know is a very uncertain life. So is knowledge of what God wants of us enough? So I don't, I, I don't think it's the knowledge of what God wants of us because, but I would say um, a feeling that God is with us, that a feeling that I'm in God's hands and therefore I give myself over to what God wants. I'm talking like I'm such a believer, but, <laughs> um, but I, I do. I also envy people like that, but um, I, I, to say what, uh, to feel calmed by what God wants of us, that I, that's where I veer off. Okay. All right. I hope and I hope not that God heard you now, Linda, with both things that you said. <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Okay, it's Michael. Um, Michael. I, I agree with Linda. Uh, I don't think knowing what God wants of me makes me any calmer in a difficult situation. I believe it's this idea of um, you're close to God, and I believe that God is there to help. So... When things, terrible things happen, I look to God for strength. So that allows me to go on. Um, on the other hand, when good things happen, I have a great gratitude toward God. Okay. So, so it's okay. my relationship. J just knowing what God expects, that in itself doesn't give me any kind of calmness. It's, it's the relationship I have with God that counts. Okay. Okay. And we will get back to one of your comments i believe later anyone else stan you're on mute stan now i'm unmuted right okay yes, you are. <clears throat> well this is a, a bit of almost personal but not personal because i'm thinking of avital sharansky she took nine years of her life to try to get her husband out i saw her on many occasions where she would be praying in the corner of her room by herself. And I'd never met anybody like that before because when I would speak to her about, he was going through hunger strikes and he was ill. She had this, literally a certain calmness about her because she always felt that there was hope and we, we should never give up. That was her attitude. And she went through one year after another after another with this attitude and she was brought up in a completely assimilated environment in russia she started when she went to israel she was she met some 
some very, very dedicated rabbis who talked with her. She studied with them and she acquired a calmness that was remarkable and became, and became a, a, a heroine as far as I'm concerned mm -hmm. of, the wor of the world. For sure, for sure. Rocha. Marlene. I'm not sure that the word calmness fits. Okay. Um, basically, if I'm in a situation and I think that God wants certain things of me, um, that makes me actually less calm than um, I would be if I didn't have that feeling or that sensitivity. I, I agree that I think that um, I have the feeling many times that God is with me in certain situations and has helped me through, but it didn't make me, but if I am, um, if I am the, um, the master of the situation, in other words, if I'm dealing with a situation and I'm in command, um, the fact that God wants certain things of me actually puts more um, demands on me than if I didn't think that way. Interesting. Okay. Yeah. Somebody else. Can I say something else? Sure. Yes, Esther. I think it also depends on the age of the person. Because mm -hmm. I remember reading an article that the person of the age of 80 is less anger, less tension than a younger person because he takes every day as it is and he appreciates life more. So the, I think the comfort zone that an older person has is different from the younger person. That's very interesting. Yeah, I'm sure that's true. I mean, we can all be witness is to that in ourselves, perhaps. Um, I have a question for you. You said you, the joy of working part time is that you have some time to do what you want. Do you ever have enough time to do everything you want? No, <laughs> because we should all want a great deal, a great deal. Okay, now you'll see why I use the word calmness um, very soon. My next question is, because I've said that thinking is something our tradition, we have said is important to us. And thinking of tomorrow and future generations. When you think of tomorrow, but not, please God, literally tomorrow, but a tomorrow in which I, you, no longer exist, does that give you a high? Like, can you feel a sense of wonder about that? Um, in other words, what I'm trying to ask is two principles that are very important to our tradition and that we have discussed over the last few years, thinking and understanding and appreciating God and giving gratitude to God and realizing we are part of a very special chain. Does that give us a sense of being, for lack of a better word, fine? Does it help us get through what I'm also again going to say is a life that is very insecure. Now, without a doubt, without a doubt, <coughs> our tradition asserts that our meaningful essence as a link in the chain of Jewish and world history is very important. However, we're going to suggest today that more important perhaps than these rational and cerebral 
notions to ensuring that we survive in this insecure world is emotion. Now the question is, which emotion? As much as our tradition asserts the principles of thinking and believing that we're in a chain, our tradition also, and I've always said that the Chazal, our sages are great psychologists, our tradition in the Tanakh, in the Talmud, in the Middle Ages, also recognizes and understands the anxiety as opposed to calmness we human beings can experience when we realize we are temporary links. Temporary. Temporary what? Links in this chain. Yeah. Or just leave it at that, that we are temporary. And it would be hard to find, I think, somebody who doesn't have that somewhere in the back of their head, that we are temporary. So it forces you, not everybody perhaps, and I'm envious of them, to, to choose a way or find a way, if there is a way, to get through this temporary situation that we're in. Now, what helps us deal with such anxiety? Now that I've explained myself, well, if you anxiety of us being temporary and living in an uncertain future. Well, I think For all of us do that. So what emotion helps if it's an emotion with that anxiety? Yes. I think of Joseph who went through such difficult times, but didn't lose his faith that God will help him later on. So he went through jail. He went through what his brothers did to him. So I think his faith in God and the existence of God, he didn't forget what he learned at home, helped him through life. Okay, so faith. Anything else? I think there's hope. I think we have to have a certain kind of hope to get us through and also to uh, have, have a future, you know, because, uh, you know, sometimes we, we become so terrified with, with uh, what the anxieties are and the threats are that, uh, you know, we have to remind ourselves that we've been here for so many years and it will continue and just to sort of have that hope. Oh, the children, knowing that the children would continue. Okay, so that's what one of our thinkers today, and it's why I said bluntly, is that enough to make you feel okay, knowing that you've written books, you've painted art pieces, and that they will continue after you? Does that really keep you on a high? Now, our tradition talks about emotions a great deal. Mm -hmm. And interestingly enough, happiness and joy, it distinguishes between those emotions. Can anyone suggest what the difference is between them? Joy is temporary. Interesting response. I'm going to phrase it in a different way, but before I do, anybody else? What does that mean? That happiness is long lasting? You're happy with your lot, you're happy with your life, but when you go to your child's wedding, it's a momentary joy. Okay, all right. Anyone want to add to that? Happiness, is considered to be almost an attitude that one has happiness or not happy, an attitude to life as a whole. 
Am I a happy person? Am I happy with my life? And as Esther said, joy is something in the moment. And we know that moments pass, but that moment when it is joyous is incomparable. Now, which is more helpful or important to our lives? A steady sense of, I'm happy, or those particular moments, like today is Bev's anniversary. I hope that's a moment of joy. The Solomons are going to a graduation tonight of a grandchild. The Habers went to senior kindergarten graduation. So did I. And you, this week, okay. So those are special moments. Do we rely on those moments? Think about it. It's an interesting notion. Do we look, do we need those moments to really keep us going, even if we feel overall we're happy? I think yes, because memories are a very important part of our happiness. If you have good memories, it's a tremendous plus. And so I'm just talking for my own personal uh, life. So I have good memories and that's what carries me on. Okay, and those are throughout. Okay, now you said first that joy is temporary. Okay. But, but if we go with what you just it. said, joyous was... moments become a memory. Yeah. But even while you're there within that moment, and maybe it's three hours. Okay, now let's look at our sources on this subject. What do you think of this first text? I know that there is nothing better for people than to rejoice and do good while they live. So I saw that there is nothing better for a person than to rejoice in his work because that is his lot. So I commend rejoicing in life because there is nothing better for a person under the sun than to eat and drink and drink and rejoice. However many years anyone may live, let him rejoice in them all. What do you think of this person's philosophy? It's something to aspire to, but it's not realistic. <laughs> well, what in there would you aspire to, Linda? I would aspire to having, uh, uh, the, the joy of appreciation, to rejoice in your work, to appreciate that, to have joy in doing good, to uh, just be in those moments of life, to, to appreciate them enough to be able to rejoice in them. But sometimes okay. life doesn't allow you to do that. Well, to I, rejoice? Yes. Why? Now, do you mean because we have some moments that aren't rejoicing worthy or yes. that you don't have time? No. Okay. First. Okay. Okay. I Anyone think, else? Yeah, I think that if a person realizes that he's got some good quality and that is a quality that he makes him feel good, it's, I'll give you an example. There was a, and that's a true story. There was a young girl who went to the rabbi in Brooklyn and complained. She said, I'm not pretty, I'm not smart, I'm not this, I'm not that. I really feel so inadequate. And he said to her, tell me, what do you like to do? She says, I love to dance. He says, well, why don't you take the young girls from the community and teach them how to dance? She did that for years and she felt so validated. 
and it gave us so much joy. So it was a personal joy and it was a community benefit. Okay, thank you, Esther. We are going to get back to that very point. Florence, enjoy what looks like a delicious ice cream cone. <laughs> okay. Um, anybody else? Do you think that one can experience joy if you're unhappy? I think happiness is such an internal thing and joy is more external. I, I don't know how else to describe it, but can you one really like experience external? joy if you are not happy? Like I, I kind of find, I, I don't know. Okay, I'm trying to think of an example. If somebody is, now, do you mean overall unhappy or on a particular day, the person is in a bad mood and even if they go to uh, Simcha, they won't be able to experience the joy because I just, I, I don't think of it necessarily as being a mood. I think of it as being more of a, like a temperament, like a, the, the kind of person you are. I mean, there are people for whom, you know, everything is always half empty and, uh, you know, gray and dull and, and everything else. And yet there are people who will generally see, see the joy and the positive in, in any situation. I just don't know that without happiness, if you can experience true joy, that's all. Interesting, interesting. So you would lose out on both yeah. experiences. Yeah. Okay, we're gonna get back to that at the very, very end. But Barbara, okay, yes. yes. Don't we have to recognize that we all have moments that are a downer. For sure. And For you sure. have to know, okay, go through it and it will pass. But nobody is 100% in one level or the other. Okay. Now, Racha, Racha. go ahead. Um, I just think, you know, there's that old saying, the glass is half full or it's half empty. This is what we were talking about in many ways, because you run into people who the glass is always half empty. Unfortunately, that's, that's their attitude. And you could, if you look around what's happening today with the war in Ukraine, you look at the newspaper with, with, the, with the mass shootings in the United States every, every, every other week, unfortunately, with, it, with, with um, assimilation, with, with the closing of synagogues and churches. It's very depressing. So in order to think of, of yourself as being a glass half full person, it takes a little bit of work. It does. It, it, but that's very significant what you just said. Because look at, now, does anybody know who the author of these verses are? I don't. Kohelet, Shlomos, King Solomon from Ecclesiastes. Now, um, when he says here, rejoice in life, rejoice, rejoice. So Linda says that's something to aspire to. Um, Julia says, it can be very difficult for some people. You say it takes a lot of work. Even perhaps for somebody who's happy. And what's going to help us rejoice? So what if it takes a lot of work? What do they say? You just quoted some phrase. There are other phrases that say anything that's worth anything, you have to work hard for. And I think our tradition tries to help us. And we might get that today or next week. Um, isn't, isn't life give and take? Of course, of course. Now. Bracha, I, Bracha, okay. I, I think we have to also look and see that the word rejoice has the word joy in it. So, and I think it's more than just rejoice. I think it's an outlook and the too good, to do good. So I think when you, do even something as mundane as making breakfast for your husband. And you, instead of taking a negative attitude that I have to make it, but you enjoy, you take pleasure in providing something that you both enjoy or making it for somebody else, your daughter, 
something that gives you pleasure. It's an outlook on life. Okay. I, I, but I, I just want to say, I know you want to go on with this. No, it's okay, Linda. <laughs> okay. I, I, that, um, you know, it's one thing to say certain people have a certain outlook and some people see the glass half full and half empty and all of that. But there are periods in a person's life where they may have an optimistic light outlook in general, but, but their situation doesn't allow them to be optimistic. And, and I think we have to acknowledge that and, and not sort of put on a veneer of, <laughs> of, I mean, you have to be real. No, and that's the word that I wanted to use that yeah. I think that Solomon, with these sukim, he was obsessed with time and uncertainty of the future. And you know where he is always saying, hakol havel, and that's usually translated everything, vanity, vanity, vanity. Um, several rabbanim translate that, including uh, Yonatan Sachs, if one of Livracha, that know what he's bothered by and what he says we have to live with is Havel means the fleeting moment. Life is fleeting. And so he questions our purpose. And when he says rejoice here and he gives some examples, what he's doing is being very real and he's suggesting, okay, for me, it's hard to really get it. And this is King Solomon who has so much wealth, women, wives, but he still feels that doesn't do it for him, doesn't give him a sense of security. And so he's suggesting something very real. And for him is joy, rejoice, is living in the moment. Now, that might sound very contradictory to what we began with. <laughs> we are meant as Jews and as human beings to make our lives meaningful. And doesn't that mean faith and belief and feeling that we're part of a history? But he's saying, come on, get real. We at least together with the moments or the times of sadness, insecurity, illness, when it's hard to be hopeful, grab on to moments. And by the way, thank God we know people who are feeling today very insecure, but are hopeful and are rejoicing in the moment. And we are envious of people like that also. And what Kohelet says is, live in the moment because that's the only time you can truly experience joy. And joy, simcha, as opposed to another word, which we'll get to, is what our tradition wants for us. Now let's look at text number two, three, and four. This selection comes from the part in the Torah in Dvarim where we are experiencing Moshe expressing the words of Tochecha, rebuke, because we have done wrong. Now, pay attention closely. In the same chapter, chapter 28, in verse 15, he says the following, and it will be if you do not obey the Lord, your God, to observe, to fulfill all his commandments and statutes, which I am commanding you this day, that all these curses will come upon you and overtake you. Now, remember that as we read the next time, later on in the chapter that he reviews. All these curses will befall you, pursuing you, 
and overtaking you to destroy you because you did not obey the Lord, your God, to observe his commandments and statutes, which he commanded you. And they will be as a sign and a wonder upon you and your offspring forever because you did not serve the Lord, your God, with simcha, with happiness and with gladness of heart when you had an abundance of everything. So what is the difference? It's not enough to just do what God wants, but more important to him is in fact what we're feeling when we are doing this. That's called a mitzvah shel simcha or simcha shel mitzvah. Of, of the emotion that goes with it. So God is not looking for us to just do something, but simcha is mentioned many times in the book of Dvarim and in the pessimistic book of Ecclesiastes Kohelet. And we're all familiar in Tehillim, Eve do, Eve do, Eve do, Eve do, et Hashem b'simcha, that we are meant now to come before God in joy. Now, of course, Linda, it, this isn't meant to say that every moment you can do that. No, it's just saying, I want to ask you, why do so many people fill the bakeness at the shul on the serious days of Rosh Hashanah and Yom Kippur, as opposed to the Freilacha, Shabbat and Yom Tov. There's gotta be a sense there of many people missing out on that God is not looking for us to be just serious and in awe, but joyous. He wants that for us, even if he's contributed to those joyous moments not being enough for us. Now, I said there is, as opposed to joy, which is that really high feeling, what is the word, another word for happy? Ashray, we all know this, and this is from Tehillim, and we say this every day. Mm -hmm. Happy is the man that hath not walked in the counsel of the wicked, nor stood in the way of sinners, nor sat in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of the Lord, and in his law doth he meditate day and night. And he shall be like a tree planted by streams of water that bringeth forth its fruit in its season, and whose leaf does not wither, and in whatsoever he doeth, he shall prosper." But now, yeah. what do you think yeah. of this text? Does it grab you? Is there enough emotion? Is there anything missing in this scene? It's a very serene, a person is happy. He's, he's followed God, hasn't sinned, hasn't stayed with evil people. Hmm? That is described as happiness as opposed to simcha, which we're going to see again in a few but, half moments. But don't we also have the sense that Of course, of course. Somebody is meant to be happy with what they have and not always feeling you have to go after more, more, more. But is this happiness, would that suffice for you? What, do you have a sense that something is missing? Is that all that one wants? What are you picturing here? You can picture somebody it's sitting, I think it's studying not. or somebody sitting, uh, doing a good deed. I think Anybody it's, have a sense of something missing from this? Obviously, I think there is. <laughs> I think you need to have, you know, again, there's, again, you're missing the joy here. Like, it's sort of, a, as you were saying before, there's a high. When, uh, when we looked at Kohelet, you know, and he was saying rejoice, rejoice in everything that you do, 
So there's a kind of high that you're aiming for. And somehow, you know, there's a, this happiness is sort of on a, a lower level. Okay. Now, yes. I, 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 what is it that will take it from happiness to joy? And I, a couple of people have alluded to it already. I Linda? Think, or it's, well, I think it's a guide. This all part is a guide of what to do. Even the curses, it's, to me, I look at it as an education. If you do that, it's like a father to a child. He says if it's a, a reward will be there. It's not really a curse, but it's a guide for behavior after and, and a way to achieve what you want to achieve. Absolutely a guide, a guide. And when you care about somebody, you're firm, you're firm. Now, we're gonna take another look at a different selection from Kohelet. And I want you to pay close, close attention to something that repeats itself over and over and what you think is being described here. I searched in my heart to indulge my body with wine and my heart conducting itself with wisdom and holding on to folly until I would see which is better for the children of men that they should do under the heavens, the number of the days of their lives. I made myself great works. I built myself houses and I planted myself vineyards. I made myself gardens and orchards, <clears throat> excuse me, and I planted in them all sorts of fruit trees. I made myself pools of water to water from them a forest sprouting to with trees. I acquired male and female slaves and I had household members. Also, I had possession of cattle and flocks more than all who were before me in Yerushalayim. I accumulated for myself also silver and gold and the treasures of the kings and the provinces, I acquired for myself various types of musical instruments, the delight of the sons of men, wagons and coaches. <clears throat> then I turned to look at all my deeds that my hands had wrought and upon the toil that I had toiled to do and behold everything is vanity and frustration, and there is no profit under the sun. Now, keep in mind what you just heard and compare it to this selection from the Torah. When a man takes a new wife, and I want you to tell me which is happiness or which is real joy and what makes it so according to our tradition. When a man takes a new wife, he shall not go out in the army, nor shall he be subjected to anything associated with it. He shall remain free for his home for one year and delight his wife whom he has taken. And now behold, I have brought the first of the fruit of the ground, which you, O Lord, have given to me. Then you shall lay it before the Lord your God and prostrate yourself before the Lord your God. Then you shall rejoice with all the good that the Lord your God has granted you and your household, you, the Levite, and the stranger who is among you. And you shall perform the festival of weeks to the Lord your God, the donation you can afford to give according to how the Lord your God shall bless you. And you shall rejoice before the Lord your God, you and your son and your daughter, your manservant and your maidservant, and the Levite who is within your cities, and the stranger and the orphan and the widow who are among you in the place which the Lord your God will choose to establish his name therein. Quickly, do you remember a big difference between Kohelet and what these different commandments are in Dvarim. What was a word that repeated itself over and over, Kohelet? What was a key word there? Sameach. 
No. I. 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 He's doing this and only referring to himself. Whereas in the Torah, it is saying that the real simcha, simcha is when you're sharing it with others. Don't make the I the be all and end all. But God does in, in the second part because uh, the three people who don't go to the army is because they don't want, if, in case they die in the army, that the last part will be, oh, I never enjoyed my wife or I never enjoyed- Oh, that's the point. That's the point that here you're doing things that the real joy is going to come from relationship, from relationship, not just what we rouse singly around you. Bracha. Go ahead, Marley. What Kohelet is really talking about is what is probably one of the biggest plagues of the 21st century. Go ahead. And that's living, Absolutely. A, living a life of materialism as opposed to investing ourselves in interpersonal relationships. Yeah, for sure, for but sure. Also not connecting to your discussion, but the first part to me is like poetry because Hebrew poetry is when you repeat sentences. Yes, and for sure. So to me, as you were reading it, I heard poetry. Okay, that's very interesting. That's interesting. You know, like you hear a tune that you really love, even though you might not be thrilled with the lyrics. Absolutely, absolutely. And it is great literature. We, we all know, we all know that. Anyone else? Rasa, I think oh, hell it's very threatening and it would put me off. Is this yeah. Helen? Yeah. And it's um, the danger with this being joyful all the time is that you, you put a mask over your eyes and you don't see reality. And if you don't see reality, there's a danger. Then you miss the important things and you make mistakes and... Um, I think joy is important, but I mean, think of an example of a family with a sick child, uh, you know, coming to them and saying you have to be joy, joyous is a little bit of a stretch. They may get a, a moment of joy if the child smiles or this or that, but the bottom line is they're broken. No, absolutely. And you just said it, that it's a moment, but this isn't a commandment first of all, of, of asking them to do something that they're not capable of. Just as what comes to mind is you're supposed to be happy in the sukkah, but somebody who is not up to it should not go in because our heritage recognizes that you can't expect people who are in certain situations to be joyous. But what Kohelet was saying that in fact, for him, because life is so precarious for all of us that we have to grab on to moments of joy. No, absolutely, absolutely. Helen. Absolutely. We're not enforcing. Not, it's not enforcing. Uh, you know, when it says the samachta b'chadecha, people ask, how can you command an emotion? Um, it's a suggestion of what is good for you and that ultimately will help you. Help you. Thank you, Ellen. Okay, anyone else? So it's not just sharing joy with others, but there's also an element in our tradition that how could we feel joyous if we know that somebody else is not feeling that? Now, reality is that there are people amongst us now in this class that we know people who are in a not wonderful way and we feel for them and we have our moments of, of, of really feeling for them, but we are going on because that's life's reality. But there's also the issue of even something like um, the discussion that Rambam has about porn. 
and being responsible for others. So we know that there are four mitzvot on Purim. They are reading the Megillah, giving gifts to our friend, Mishloch Manot, Mishteh, having a festive meal, and Matanot Le'evyonim, giving to the poor so that they can also celebrate. Which of those four do you think Rambam says, if you have to choose one, which is the one that he says you should do? And they're all mitzvot. It's a mafta. No, no, no. Here, no. so that would be the festive meal, the mishteh. You have which must, one? Must, Again. I would say to give to yeah. others, to give to the poor would be the most important. Exactly. But, it is preferable for a person to be more liberal with his donations to the poor than to be lavish in his feast, if you have to make a choice, or in sending Mishloch Manot to his friends. Indeed, there is no greater and more splendid happiness than to gladden the hearts of the poor, the orphans, the widows, and the strangers. But, One who brings happiness to the hearts of these unfortunate individuals resembles the divine presence of which it is stated in Isaiah to revive the spirit of the lowly and to revive those with broken hearts. But Bracha, according to Halakha, the only mitzvah you have to do is listen to the Megillah. Halakha, but Rambam, wise Rambam says this, and he's saying, if you have to choose, if you have to choose, and that says something about the essence and the importance that our tradition gives. Now, of course, there are going to be people, Esther, who are going to argue with that. Of course. Okay. Now, okay, you're allowed. Um, there is a character who is the great grandson of the Baal Shem Tov, mm -hmm. and he's called Rav Nachman of Breslau. In the 17, late 1700s. And he's famous for this line, mitzvah gedola lios besimcha tamid. It is a great mitzvah to always be happy and to make every effort to be determinedly, to determinedly keep gloom at bay. Okay, so Helen's gonna say he's not being realistic, but he's going to the extreme hoping that at times we will be. And he gives Hello. such a beautiful analogy here. Sometimes, and you can picture this, we've all been in this situation. When people are happy and dance, picture people at a wedding, at a bar bat mitzvah, and we're dancing in the horror circles, and there are people standing on the outside. What do we often do? Sometimes when people are happy and dance, they grab someone standing outside the circle of dancers who has the blues. Against his will, they bring him in, notice how he's referring just to him, into the circle of dancers, against his will, they force him to be happy along with them. Now, I'm sure everyone here has seen that happen, or we've even done it. Either it's been something we've done or people have done it to us because People are dancing for joy, and that's going to be fleeting. But they see somebody who's not, and you put out your hand because you want that person to join. And sometimes you succeed, and sometimes you don't. But that's just a notion that it is our responsibility. Now, this doesn't mean that when somebody is not in the mood for a reason that we don't, please mute yourself, that we don't uh, respect that. No, no, we're giving overall picture here. Now, he brings- Raka, Raka, I just have to say, I just have to ask, you've been in Israel now a few years. Have you had the opportunity to be at a stoplight 
and see one of the cars that say on it, Rav Nachman, stop and have people come out because they have music in the, um, they have music blaring from their cars. They get out at the light and they will just start dancing. Now you can be in a mood, you can be sad, you can be angry, you can be whatever you are, but it's just like at that wedding. You get a absolutely smile on your face that. immediately. I immediately. would like, absolutely. And, and, and the ahead. other thing I just want to add here, because I see we're getting shortened, um, is that I work with, um, I, some of my staff are very, very religious women. And it's not that they don't complain when one of the children is sick or about a million other things, but there is also an attitude and there's a Hebrew expression, which is gamzu letova, which means this is also for good. And it's not a cop-out in their minds to say um, that it's, it's for the better that it happened, but it's an attitude in life. First of all, you don't have to be religious to feel that way because you didn't get the job. Maybe something will come along that's better. Maybe it didn't work. It wouldn't have worked out the way you really wanted it. But it's a real attitude. I have to accept it because if this is the way God wanted it, then who am I to disagree? Who am I to go against it? And God bless them that they live this way and their lives are on a certain level much easier. And maybe that's what the discussion at the beginning of the session was about yeah. being almost jealous of people being able to find that comfort or that calm. But it's, um, it's not an easy thing. Anyway, I just wanted to add that. I, I'm glad, I thank you. No, I was going to mention, not necessarily the singing, but you see kippot, uh, knitted kippot here um, with Rav Na 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 Nachman. And he's buried in Uman, where thousands of people go, even in Corona, men, before Rosh Hashanah, to his grave. He is quite a figure, quite a figure. Now, yes. I can't help but think it was actually Shula Troper who taught me the song. Rabbi Nachman Bratzlav Haya Omer Lo Lehit Ya Esh Im Higia And I don't know if Mashura Raklish Moach Yesh Thank you. <laughs> Linda, you have no idea, or maybe you do. Shula Troper. What Linda just sang is not to despair. Linda knows it, but I don't think anybody else did there. You remember Ralph Troper, who had been a principal at Betikva years and years and years ago? No? Oh, because you had your kids in day school? Oh, my God. <laughs> I just saw him last Wednesday or Thursday. He's 91. Shula, unfortunately, died very young, and they had just moved back to Israel. Uh, they were married 32 years, and Ralph, now with his second wife, who unfortunately is very, very ill, they've been married 42 years. Um, but he translates those songs till this day. Anyway, I want, Esther? Yeah. When you talked about schlepping somebody into the dance, which is yes. something that I've seen very often, and I've seen the Haredis the joy in singing, but from personal experience, when my husband died, I remember reading the book of Dr. Cousins, his autobiography, and he believed in laughter. And so in Toronto, at the, at the library, there was a course in laughing yoga. And so I decided to join it. And it's amazing how I walked in really feeling sad and walked out laughing. Yeah, oh, these sessions have their uh, benefits. I want to close. I hope it will work. That's why I left it till the end. Um, about a month and a half ago, when there was a series of terrorist attacks. So in a community called El Ad, mm -hmm. a father of five with two other men, 
was murdered. And his son, one of his five children, Nohorai Ben Boaz, um, celebrated. And I stress that word celebrate is becoming bar mitzvah last night. And the community put so much effort into making sure that it was an aesthetically beautiful simcha. And I'm closing with this for the obvious reason. This family is still in mourning, but they knew to take the joy of the moment. And you see three of, I'm gonna, I hope this works, okay. So you can see one of the brothers singing and you can see on the side, his mother and two sisters in beautiful gowns. And they're singing a song. Hoping that Abba as Shlomi Shabbat, one of the most important singers of our time in Israel, that he will um, rest peacefully if he hasn't come back home. Um, and that says it all, grabbing on to- Isn't home. it the same with if a wedding after a funeral, you're supposed to keep the wedding and celebrate. Yeah, yeah. So, um, <coughs> so grab on to those moments. Shirley Ann, remember with Harvey, does he know how you feel about making him breakfast? I forget what you said you made. And uh, Esther, your memories and uh, Debbie and Stan, enjoy tonight. Thank you. And, uh, anybody else have a simcha and you keep dancing Bev and David and everybody else. And I don't see your face, but I see Anne. If you're here, it's good to have you. It's been a while. Okay, everyone. Tadaraba. This, this Shabbat, uh, this Shabbat, I'm celebrating my 50th anniversary. Mazel tov. Oh, I thought you were going to say 50th birthday, and I said no. <laughs> you retired. <laughs> Thank Stem you. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. Mazel tov. Wow. <laughs> wonderful. 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 Ten year boo. Okay. Take care. Nice class, Bracha. Toda Rabba. Oh. Thanks, Bracha. Thanks so much. Thank you very much. Keep being happy. Keep Thank being you. happy. Be happy. Be happy.